Um, so I just want to say a big thank you to Leon and the whole team for what you've created because it really matters that we have these opportunities to come together. Um, and I also just want to thank the camp uh, because they are supporting partners of the Drupal Association, the only camp that is. And basically a supporting partner is someone who says we really, um, you know, want to you know, join forces and help the association fund Drupal.org and all the work we do. We have an engineering team, we have infrastructure costs, and most of that's paid because of supporting partners. Um, so I just want to say a big thank you for that kind of support and giving back. So thank you. Um, and, you know, throughout all these years of working with the Drupal community, you know, I have to support all kinds of stakeholders. You have your um, your developers and your site builders, um, trainers, um, and of course we have the agencies that are here to build um, sites for clients, and then of course, you know, all the clients out there, all the customers using Drupal. And I have a, a real special place in my heart for the digital agency stakeholder. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and what, you know, kinds of conversations I want to have with you. And, and, but the reason I have like this real appreciation for digital agencies is because uh, Drupal requires um, agencies to really have like they're like double levers for growth, and they have to invest in two ways. It's very unique for an agency to have to invest in. I mean, one, the agency owner is the one that says, "Yes, we would like to work with Drupal and build sites with Drupal," and then we're going to invest and get clients and build these amazing digital experiences for clients with Drupal. That's your typical investment that a business makes. But what's unique about these digital agencies that are supporting the Drupal communities? They're also investing back into Drupal uh, and the people that are building the software that's being used. So they're funding camps. They're making sure they have a culture of contribution where their employees are contributing back code. Um, they're supporting partners where they're helping to fund Drupal.org. And so for me, it's very important to take care of our digital agency business ecosystem because there are levers for growth on both kind of that R&D side of the project and that all the community health as well as getting more people to fall in love with Drupal. So, um, I want to have more of a conversation this year about what we can do together. Uh, so, you know, that's just why I'm really excited to be here today um, and, and to have these conversations. And before I kind of go into my talk, I wanted to just know a little bit more about the room. Um, how many of you are with a digital agency? Raise your hand. Okay, so it's about a little more than 50%. And the rest, you are end users using Drupal? Yeah? Okay, great. Um, and for those that are working at a digital agency, um, raise your hand if the majority of your buyers are coming from the technical side of your clients versus marketing. Yeah. And then raise your hand if you're selling more to the marketing side. So yeah, that's about, that's what I'm seeing in the marketplace. That's what I want to talk about. So I want to talk about, um, I'll just kind of go through my, well, that's my hello. And so for my talk, what I want to cover is um, uh, the insights that I have. You know, I'm in this, situ this position where I get to talk with agencies all over the world, and I kind of get um, this unique opportunity to see where the trends are and, um, and be able to kind of like aggregate that and share it out with you. So I want to talk about some insights, and then I'm going to kind of like summarize it with a little SWOT that, um, you know, I think we could probably even do one together and expand it, but um, I think it tells a good story. And then I want to talk about what the association is going to be doing this year as it relates to some of the trends that we're talking about. Um, and then I just want to let you know where our head's at as the association and how we want to have some bigger conversations with the project. Um, so why don't we <coughs> start here? Um, so the, the TLDR of this whole talk is that the future is bright for Drupal. And with all things technology, there's change. And change creates opportunity. And if we understand the changes, and we understand how to position ourselves to take advantage of these opportunities, that Drupal can keep growing and expanding beyond what we are today. Um, and so I want to just start with some of the insights that I'm seeing. And I thought I'd just start with, um, kind of just some comparisons about change and technology. 
and, and starting with a story of my own, um, and the whole thing was like basically what was is again. Uh, we've, we've been through a change as a community and how Drupal's evolved um, and how we sell has evolved. I'm um, sure you've kind of seen it yourself in like just, just different ways you've had to adapt over the years. And that's not unique to Drupal. That's just with every technology. And so I wanted to talk about 1999, way back when, when I was selling application servers. And so I stole this off the internet. This is from a company called BEA, who was our competitor, because they, they, I can't find anything from 1999 about the company I work for, which is called Bluestone Software. But we competed with BEA, and they had an application server. And at the time, everyone was just like, ooh, I want to go from bricks to clicks. And they wanted to start storefronts, right? And they might have had like a static website. And they're kind of just starting like what we now call a digital transformation. But like this was like really the start of it. And at the time, I could sell an application server. I'm like, well, if you want to go from bricks to clicks, you're going to need an application server. And I was selling a point product. And it was, you know, at the time, it was pretty easy. And then eventually, what happened was is the, the business owner said, OK, that's great. We've got our application server. We're starting to put things together. But I really want to go into this further. And I want to have a web experience. You know, I'm kind of using more um, current terms. I don't think they talk this way at the time, but they're basically like, I want to have a web experience where, uh, you know, it's like everything's online and I'm, I'm starting to sell online. I want to have a store, I have inventory, I've got, I want to have some personalization, you know, and it's like, it got to the point where they didn't want to talk to me about app servers. They want to talk about a solution. And so I realized I had to change and the company had to go through a transformation of its own because the person we were selling to was different. Um, it was the, the business person that had this bigger vision um, versus just talking to the, the technical person who was um, buying the app server. And they wanted to see a whole bundled solution. They wanted to have this kind of like what we now call this best of breed. Um, and so I had to go out and build all these relationships and integrations with SAP and um, interwoven. I think that was personalization at the time. I'm just trying to remember all these names back from like you know, 2000. And so what I found was, is like I'm now having a different conversation with a different person. And I'm also pulling in professional services um, that were much, you know, they were deeper engagements because they had to build out all these integrations for these um, stores that wanted to go from the bricks to the clicks. And um, yeah, so we were making more money actually because we were dealing with more complex solutions. Um, uh, you know, and so that's just an evolution of just one technology, the app server. I mean, it kind of went to a, an interesting place where like, okay, so you just get your Tomcat and you're fine and we don't need to talk about that. And BA got acquired and our company got acquired. You know, it's like these, these things evolve, right? But my, my point is, is um, there's this arc that happens with technology and you can see it even with Drupal. So when I came into the Drupal community eight years ago, Everyone had out their Drupal shingle. And they just had to say, ah, oh, I do Drupal. And they could get business, right? Like, raise your hand. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. And then I was like, I, I was coming from the solution space. So I was, I was having a hard, I was like, I didn't quite understand, because I didn't quite understand this arc myself. Like, I was just realizing this is a, a trend um, in technology. But I didn't understand at the time. So I said, well, OK, so CMS is part of a solution, like where's your integration with ERP and how are you working with like these other business apps and business process management and all these things. And they're like, I was like, so what's your stack look like? And I'd get this, I'm like, oh, I got a lamp stack. I was like, oh, okay, got it. You're selling a point product right now. and People really want Drupal and that's just where the market is. And so then what I did find over time, though, is that there are these market forces that have been happening over the years that made people realize I can't just sell Drupal and the customer wants more than just Drupal. They want these digital experiences that, um, you know, is Drupal working with other technologies that are going to create this experience for the customers and for the visitors of the sites. And, and, um, and I'll talk a bit about those market forces, but really what we've seen in, you know, 
really around the world with all the different companies that I've talked to is that we're definitely talking much more at the solution level now. We've evolved to this. And so now it's solutions in government, solutions in uh, media and publishing, and we're doing much more robust um, integrations and solutions, and we're having these more of a partnership with our customers um, and helping them solve the business problems that keep them up at night. And, um, and now when I ask people what their stacks are, it's more like this, right? Does this look a little bit more familiar, the kinds of in, in implementations that you're doing, right? They're definitely um, pretty robust. And this comes from MarTech. Um, so, and you know, you can see it with all the modules that we have too. These integrations are just super robust. And so my whole point is, is that this is our arc. And so for anyone that might have been going through this and saying, wow, I'm going through a lot of change, guess what? That's technology. And this is normal. And we just need to stay ahead of the curve. And we can, as long as we keep understanding these market forces and the trends, there's just so much more that we could be doing. Um, you know, we, we can still be thriving and growing and doing these amazing kinds of implementations for our customers. And so I want to just talk a bit about the market forces. Um, and before I do, I just realized, do I need to watch the time? Because I know we started at a different time. Uh, we're right. We'll keep the time out for you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, because I can go faster yeah, or slower. <clears throat> okay, great. So let's talk just about the market forces. So like I mentioned, I get to talk with digital agencies around the world. Um, and uh, there's just some themes. Uh, I, I didn't include everything, but, um, you know, with Drupal, um, we, we definitely have globalization uh, where really it's, everyone's picking it up around the world and that's, that is great. And what it also means is there are some parts of the world that are able to do Drupal, um, Drupal work at a lower price point. So whether it's in India or it's in Eastern Europe or um, it's in, um, gosh, I was in Costa Rica, they have a, a really great <laughs> um, uh, you know, comic offshore model. And uh, it's, what it's been doing is it's been driving down the price overall because people realize there's the opportunity to shop around. I'm like, oh, I can get that Drupal work done somewhere else at a lower price. And so I've watched companies, especially whether it's in Europe or in the U.S., people realizing, okay, so now if I want to protect my hourly rate, and I don't want to just be like um, kind of pigeonholed uh, into just this, this new price point. I need to offer more. I need to move into a solution space. And I need to uh, kind of go upstream the conversation and not just talk to maybe the CIO about like, hey, I've got the CMS and it does these things and it's highly secure. But now I need to go and talk to the business side and be like, what's keeping you up at night? Let me help you solve that. And, and so we've been seeing this evolution of digital agencies in our ecosystem wanting to um, have more of this specialty, maybe they're a full service agency now and they're doing more um, UX strategy or they're doing more design and then as they come up with the strategy they are using Drupal as part of that um, solution, the technical side of the solution. So we're definitely seeing that change. Um, and I also want to say this globalization is also great. Um, as we have had more people in these different parts of the world, um, join Drupal, they have also joined our community. And so it was amazing to go to India for DrupalCon Asia and to meet all these people that are working at TCS. Like I went to Tata Consultancy Services and there's just a floor, like floors and floors of people working on Drupal. But you know what, they also had great representation at our, at our DrupalCon. And there was so much passion for wanting to be part of this, basically it's a movement, right? And getting involved and wanting to contribute back. And, and actually our second most traffic on Drupal.org comes from India because they're there contributing. And the same when I went to Costa Rica, that's a great place for um, people in the States to um, partner with um, because they're in the same time zone. Um, it's easy to get to. And I was just down there at their camp this summer and they're in the same, in the same place. Like, yes, this is great and it's helping our economy and we can partner and do all these great things with Drupal, but they were really excited to be at that camp to give back. So globalization might be affecting the price point, and we're adapting to that, but also keep in mind, it's good for our community too. These people are giving back as well. Um, and just kind of giving perspective, things like globalization is obviously not unique to us. Um, I just, you know, sometimes it's so easy to be kind of myopic of what's happening in Drupal and be like, oh, that 
makes me a little nervous. And you pull the lens back, and you can look at this. Um, there's some great reports from a group called Society of Digital Agencies, and they did some research with Forrester, and it was a global research. And you know what? Digital agencies just overall, it's one of their top three concerns is global is um, people uh, outsourcing, right? So we're not alone in this. This is just how the market works. And <coughs> Um, you know, there's a, some, they had some other concerns like commoditization or their clients are starting to insource things like analytics and so that might be affecting their business. And these are just very um, important things to know, but also to know that it's not unique to Drupal. This is just how the marketplace is working. Another trend is that there are a lot more CMSs than there were before. And uh, so it's gotten even more important for Drupal to get clear on its strengths and its product market fit, right? And so um, and we, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but it's forced people to realize what kind of clients are really the right ones and where to spend the most time going after your, your business, right? And where can you make the biggest impact for someone? Um, so, you know, you're filling your pipeline with the right kinds of clients that are best matched for what Drupal can do and, and really create the business value that they're looking for. And, you know, it's going to continue. It's like now we're all into headless, and that's, that's great, but there's also now headless CMSs, and we have to be mindful of that. And just keep getting clear um, in terms of what makes Drupal unique and how we sell that. And also, just as a community, what are we doing to keep innovating the software so that it, um, you know, Basically, so we stay competitive, right? Um, and then the other trend that I think is a really important one is the rise of the CMO. And so I saw a lot of hands going like, hey, who's selling to the, the marketing side of the house? And there was a lot that went up. There's a lot that were like, ah, it's kind of getting there. And that's what I'm seeing um, in a lot of places around the world is that there is this, this shift that's happening. It's not totally there. Um, a couple of years ago, Gartner said that uh, marketing will be making the technology buys um, in the future. And we're definitely, we're, we're definitely there. Um, 2016, 2017, the CMO, um, based on this survey, the CMO was spending pretty much the same on technology as the CIO. Um, and so, you know, that kind of has changed who company, like digital agencies, who they're talking to and who they're selling to and how they sell. It's, it really changes your DNA because, you know, at the end of the day, oh, I should say, we're also seeing it on Drupal.org. Um, so we've been, 93% of our traffic is anonymous. And um, I'll talk about why we're starting to really get into our data and, and, we, and why we want to start um, uh, improving our site, but in, in the first step was understanding who this anonymous traffic is coming to the front page. And it's still technical, but we're starting to see the rise of the CMO right here at Drupal.org. And so, you know, this is a real thing that we have to prepare for as well. Um, and, you know, it's important to get into the heads of that CMO. Uh, when you have an agency that's been talking a lot to the technical side, when you're talking a lot about um, is it the right choice, especially in terms of security and total cost of ownership? You know, you have to realize that the CMOs are really different. They want to have different conversation. They have different needs. Um, oops. So, you know, really the CMO is all about business growth, business success. Their head's a lot more into, like, the same space as the CEO. Maybe a little bit more focused on just growing the business, where a CEO is thinking about growing the company in different kinds of ways. Um, but it, it is a different mindset, and of course, they're trying to think about that business growth in terms of growing revenue through leads, um, through conversions, and they're thinking about that customer engagement and also proliferation of the brand and having that brand recognition. And they, when they are thinking about how to do that, of course, they have a team that um, have different kinds of needs. And they need tools to support the work that they do. And these teams are your content editors, your content writers, your copywriters, um, PR, social media, SEO, e-commerce, and marketing technologists. And we have to really be mindful about what it is that they have to do and what success looks like for them and how we make them successful. And what they want is not like, oh, is this going to be a secure way of adding content to the site, right? Like, they want fast. They want to be able to make an impact. They want, um, they need it easy. These marketing people in the marketing departments, 
um, you know, they want autonomy to use the tool to get that press release out. They don't have time or want to call an IT person and be like, hey, that's not quite working right. They want to click the buttons that they need to click so they have total control to move fast and get their content out because that's how they are measured on success. And if they're not successful, guess what they do? They go to the CMO and like, get rid of it, right? These people have a lot of power in um, how technology stays in their organization. And so it's really important that we understand them. And the one um, person that I'm really interested in getting to know uh, more about is the marketing technologist. And it could be the CMO, but it could be someone in staff. And this is the person who chooses the technology tools um, that the team needs to use. And this is the criteria, like, is it going to make an impact for our business? Is it going to help our team achieve their goals? Is it fast? Is it easy? Does it give them the autonomy that they need, the data analytics that they need to make smart decisions? Um, and what they want is the ability to have best of breed solutions so they can pick and choose. Um, and they need to make sure everything works together in concert for that business impact, right? So. Uh, this is a, a pretty important persona for us to get to know. And that marketing technologist is looking at all of this technology and all these kinds of technologies. So are you familiar with MarTech? No? It might be something to explore. MarTech is, um, well, marketing technology is, you know, what it's referring to. And MarTech is basically the... Um, organization that's really talking about all the technologies that marketing people want to buy. And they have conferences and it's all for the CMO and the content editors to go and find out what's the new emerging technology to use to go move your business forward. And so they are, well that marketing technologist is picking all of these, and I know this is now very hard to see. Um, but it has things like e-commerce and SEO tools and it's got your um, customer mapping journey tools. It's just like everything that a marketing person would want. And a CMS is right here, right? And so when we are starting to work with the CMO, it's really important to understand they're looking at all of this. And we need to make sure that our CMS and Drupal specifically is relevant to their conversation. Really, how are we that digital hub? that's going to pull all of that together and all the complex content that they're doing you know they want to be content first they want to be commerce first they want to be community first and they have all these tools to make that happen and we need to be able to position Drupal as the digital hub that's pulling all this together right and so um, I think it's like you know one of the things that's on top of top of mind for me is how do we help everyone have that kind of message as we start having to shift to selling into the CMO um, so, and actually before I get into that, I think it's also important to know that where they're buying, and I'll go into this some more, is analytics, personalization, and emerging technology. So a lot of that content first, personalization, AI, very content heavy. Drupal is really well suited uh, to be positioned with people that are going after those initiatives. Um, but I also just want to be really clear, this is a market trend. It's not like we can just abandon the CIO side and the technology side because, you know, like everyone had their hands up for, for both when I said who's, who's your buyer. And that's still the case, right? It's still the case that you have your marketing buyer, you have your um, technology buyer, and it also differs by industry. We were just talking about how probably the technology side is still going to be the decision maker in certain sectors like government, university. But if you're talking to consumer goods, if you're talking to finance, you know, there's different sectors where it's, it's really shifted to the CMO. Um, and then I think it's also important to say that you can't stop thinking about the developer, right? That's why camps are so important because it attracts these developers. We're going to have a lot of developers tomorrow. Um, and they're, they're the influencers. You know, we still have, when I do a lot of my user research and I talk to customers about how did you get um, Drupal, uh, how did you choose Drupal? I'm like, oh, well, this developer heard about Drupal and they were playing with it and then they used it at a departmental level. And, and you know, and then we said we need to replatform and we already knew a lot about Drupal. We could see what it could do. And now, look, it's the, the entire university is using it, right? So, so while I just said a lot about the CMO, I just also want to be really clear. We can't abandon what also works for us too, which is talking to the CIO and, and catering to the developers. But, I also do want to talk about some opportunities and why I think it's like as things start shifting to the CMO, it's also really important to know um, that there are some opportunities for us as Drupal digital agencies. Um, so 
yes, in 2016, 2017, uh, the CMO and the CIO were basically spending the same amount of money on technology. But the year later, CMOs reduced their spend. And that's because they realized, I just bought a lot of technology and I don't really know how to do this, <laughs> right? They're not dumb, I'm not saying that at all. But they're kind of in a brave new world and they're trying to figure all this out. So they had to slow down their spend. And now they're saying like, I was gonna in insource a lot of things like analytics and personalization. And guess what? Like, I need an agency who can help me figure this out. I need a partner. I need someone who can um, help me connect the dots and get the return on investment for all this money that I just spent. So this is, I think, a huge opportunity for us. And then another opportunity based on just some, some things, um, this was on that Forrester um, research with the Society of Digital Agencies, was that um, there are already a lot of agencies selling to the CMO. They've been there for a while doing digital work. But what this research was saying is that these agencies have not really thought in a robust way about digital experiences. They might be thinking about your digital ad buy and, and advising there or advising on analytics. And what I was saying was that those that might have been there before we've gotten there have, might have a myopic view of what a digital experience is and how to create that. And so they're really maybe not as positioned to uh, be the partners of choice. I think Drupal digital agencies actually are really well positioned to fill that need. Um, because you've been doing all, you've, because of all those other market trends that got you to think about solutions and doing complex integrations, all you need to do is really understand what their business problems are and you're, you know how to do that and then really partner with them on how to pull together their technology and be a partner in the business impact that needs to be made. Okay, so. <laughs> We're just, we're good? Okay. Okay, great. So let's just go into um, competitive analysis. Like how is Drupal doing? Um, you know, I kind of talked about the market trends and how I think that works well for us. Um, and I want to talk to just like drill down into the software itself and the competitive landscape. <laughs> Uh, you know, one thing that uh, I've realized is that over the years, Dries, Dries Beitart, who's the, um, I always say his last name wrong, I apologize, but, um, uh, you know, he's been trying to explain that Drupal is for ambitious digital experiences, and that's been hard for people to understand, right? And um, so he did a presentation at DrupalCon Vienna that explains a little bit more, um, it, and I think it is an interesting word or a phrase to use, and I want to kind of talk about that a bit just so we're clear, we're, we're aligned about what that means. And I'll tell a quick little story, which is my staff didn't know what this means. Um, and, and a lot of that's because we have been hired to nurture the developer community, so we have this DNA to understand developer speak. Um, and so when th these words were said, we're like, okay, Drupal's for ambitious digital experience, but it didn't resonate, we didn't understand. And so as we've been looking at this rise of the CMO and realizing that we need to kind of evolve our programs to not just be for the builders, but also the marketers, I've been doing some in-house training and I had someone come in and speak to us so we can understand this marketing persona. And they started showing us um, websites, whether it's Adobe, or Marketo, Salesforce, and they're all using this phrase called digital experience. And my staff said, oh, Dries didn't make this up. This is like a term. They're like, yes, it is. It's a term that marketing people use, right? And it's, it's like this shift of perception and, and understanding there's a whole nother world out there with a whole nother language. And that Dries was tapping into that, that we, you know, at the DA, we didn't know we had to make that shift too. So I'm not sure if that's also one of the reasons why I didn't always resonate with the community. That's why it didn't resonate for us, just in full transparency. We had to realize this whole marketing world in some of their language. Um, but what I think is important um, is just kind of getting down to what it is and isn't. Um, so when we talk about these ambitious digital experiences, we talk about like, oh, it's these sites that have great reach, right? Like lots of visitors um, and needs to really be able to scale up and serve all these visitors. Uh, but you know, that could be brochureware, right? That could just be like, a lot of people wanna see this brochureware and that's not what we would say ambitious, but you know, if you're doing brochureware, let's say that needs to 
be read in multiple languages, maybe it's serving all of different European countries, and all of a sudden you're doing multilingual, it's starting to get rich. Yeah, a little e-commerce is getting richer, right? And so like that more complexity in that stack that you're building, right, and that architecture that you have, like, that's what he means by rich. And so, you know, um, it's, it's definitely gotten, I, I think it was bold and right to say that Drupal is not for some things, right? Like, I actually am starting this women's unconference. It's very small. I needed to get some of my ideas out. I just did a Wix site. And it's like, I'll just bang this out the Wix site, right? Because it's not ambitious and it's for five people that I can communicate to. That's basically what it was for. I'm not gonna use Drupal for that. And it's okay, right? We know that when you're starting to do the more robust things, if I'm selling tickets and I need it to be in different languages because my this conference idea I have is just gonna be wild and wildly successful, then then it's you know, maybe I'll move to Drupal for that. Right, so I think it's important what it is and what it is not. Um, but then people say, well, what are you saying is just for the enterprise? Did we abandon our base? And the answer is definitely not. Like, I think that's so important to say again and again that Drupal is for these complex um, types, types of implementations, but you know, the mid-market really is like core and they do many interesting things with Drupal. Uh, it, that is not going to go away at all. And it also, Drupal 8's been designed so it also can serve the enterprise. And so I think I've been seeing a lot more enterprise customers over the years because of uh, Drupal 7, Drupal 8. And so it, it's a yes and. Um, and so, you know, it, we could talk some more about this and I'd love to hear what people's perceptions are here because every region's a little bit different how they interpret this ambitious digital experience. And if you have a better word, we're open to it, you know, but I think it's just really important to be clear about where Drupal's playing and what that product market mix is. And I think what it, we're really saying is that it's really a broad product market mix. It's, it's very wide, which is a good thing. Um, and so the, um, you know, One Shoe and Exove and the Drupal Association put out a survey this past year that had some really great data about what's happening with Drupal. And it's, it, it came back with some really positive news and also some things that validated an assumption I had, which is if we're, if Drupal, especially Drupal 8, is more for um, these robust, ambitious digital experiences, what's happening in our pipeline? You know, are we starting to get less clients but more in, uh, deeper engagements? Um, versus in 2012 when I kind of was starting up, it was, people were just getting a lot of smaller, smaller opportunities, smaller clients, and just really having to fill their pipeline all the time. I wasn't sure where we were in that spectrum. Uh, and what, what this was showing was that, yeah, we are having deeper engagements. We are getting bigger deals because we're doing these more robust implementations. But what also was great was uh, it, our pipelines are growing too. So it's not like that less, you know, less clients and deeper engagements. It's like more and more, right? I, th I think this is a positive thing. So big thanks to Michelle for running that survey. Lots of other great data in there. And then, um, you know, what I'm hearing is in the mid-market, the big competition is WordPress. It might be Typo3 in, in some of the countries here in Europe. Um, and then on the enterprise side, it seems to be more Adobe. Um, and so when you look at this, and I just grabbed this from Built With the other day. So first I have to say Built With is not pulling in Drupal 8 data at all. And we're working with them to pull in the right file. So you have to take this with a grain of salt right now. Um, but basically, you know, it's saying that Drupal it, for the entire web has gone down. And um, it's like we just said that we don't want that lower market, right? That's not where Drupal fits. And I think that's why it's going down. And that's what we want. That's not a, to me, that's not a bad thing. That's just saying we made a choice and we're just watching that choice um, have its, 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 its being realized, that's all. Um, and then I look at uh, million, um, we've, we're going up for the, the category called million, and then 100K we're going up. Like there's definitely some growth that's happening there. That 10K, like that might be the enterprise that's going down, and I think it's Adobe that's <coughs> going up there. Um, you know, I'd be curious, like once, since it's not pulling in Drupal 8 data, you know, we just don't have great statistics of what's happening in the marketplace right now. And this is the closest we have. So this isn't great. But it is telling a story of like, the things we said should happen are happening, right? We're not going after 
uh, total market share. We're not trying to grow our market share of the total web because we don't want the brochures in the blog sites and things like that. We are growing that mid-market, and I think we have some good challengers in the enterprise. Um, but I also pointed out a lot of opportunities that we had to go after there, too. From a product perspective, and Dries talked about this a bit, we have some, um, some areas of improvement that we need to work on, and one is ease of use. Um, I talked about the content editor. Um, they need an easy experience. They need to be able to work fast. And we need our product to serve their needs. Um, we really need to start building for them. And the story about that I like to share is um, my coworker, who's now our head of Marcom, was working at a company called Learning.com. It was built on Drupal. And she was hired as a content editor. And she walked in, and she's trying to use this CMS called Drupal, but it wasn't built with her needs in mind. Um, and it was really hard. The whole department didn't know how to use it. They couldn't find the trainer. The trainer had left. There wasn't any documentation. And they just said, we can't, we can't do our job. And they just switched to WordPress, right? Like the content editors have a lot of power in whether you keep your account or not, right? So it's really important to understand what those content editors and the commerce people, that marketing technologists, mm -hmm. what they need and build for them. Um, and I have lots of stories of, of accounts being um, disrupted because they were unhappy. So, you know, there's a lot that's happening on the product side. We have different initiatives happening in the community, um, whether it's the out-of-the-box experience, um, workflows, lots of different in initiatives that are already addressing this. So it's not like we're flat-footed. We know this and we're working on it. Um, and then the other area is total cost of ownership. So, um, you know, while Drupal is free, there are some costs that you may not um, have with other CMSs because you need to have an IT person on staff to do your updates, right? There are just some inherent costs that don't necessarily need to be there that we could solve for. So, for example, um, auto updates is one initiative that we're starting so that we can, especially in the mid-market, make it so it's a lot well, cheaper to maintain, a lot cheaper and easier to maintain your sites. And you don't have to do everything so manually and pay that, that the talent that you have to do that. So that's another area that we're focusing on. Another area is sustainability. Um, you know, as a project, we want to be sustainable. And it's really top of mind for me because I think about in the community, do we have sustainability of our camp organizers? This is a lot of work. Um, I really like that this camp has a mentor program, right? They're training their, their next... Uh, leaders, basically, right? And are we doing that throughout the project? And um, I, I also think about our uh, module maintainers and um, their incentives and motivations for migrating their module to Drupal 8, for example. Um, I think about even the Drupal Association and our sustainability. And um, I think we're in a good place, but I look at other projects like WordPress that have, uh, they believe in free open source software, but they also have models where they monetize and commercialize around their software, whether it's WordPress.com or they're selling their plugins through a marketplace, and they use that, that, those funds to invest into the project. Um, they have so much money, they're now buying ads on the radio. And so if you know anything about advertising, if you're buying ads on a radio, you've got money to burn, <laughs> right? I want to have money to burn for our project, right? And so I think a lot about that. Um, and as we know, Drupal has a ton of strengths. Drupal 8 is on the rise, and we can see in the, the research that one shoe and if so they did, that um, Drupal 8 is being used much more than Drupal 7 now. Uh, and it has all the strengths that we know. It's like I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, so I won't spend too much time on here. But really, as um, Paul Johnson likes to say, it's all about the ability to build the art of the possible. Right? It's customizable. Uh, you can build that best of breed solution. There's just so much that you can do with it. It's really powerful. And um, of course, it's secure. And we have this amazing customer base and lots of stories to tell so that we have a good foundation to build from. But one of my favorite strengths that we don't, we just can never talk about enough in my mind is the power of our community. They are so passionate. Uh, we have on our board um, Annie Miller, who's a VP of Partnerships at WPP. Um, she handles the partnerships with Drupal. She handles it with Adobe, with Salesforce, Marketo, for WPP. And 
um, she came to DrupalCon Vienna and she's like, this community is off the hook. Like quote unquote, she's like, I go to all these other conferences, you don't get this. You don't get this passion for the software and the people behind it that you get here with Drupal. And uh, our other board member is Mike Lamb, um, who's the Senior Director of Engineering at Pfizer. Um, and he went all in on Drupal 8. And he said that um, he came to DrupalCon and he just saw the passion of the community. He's like, yep, I'm going with Drupal 8 because this is what's behind it, right? And this is a unique uh, differentiator for us. I hate to say that because these are human beings, but it is amazing how passionate they are and what that means to our project. And, you know, kind of just taking it to another level, it's also unique in how much we um, believe in inclusion. And I think it's really important just to pause and talk about this for a minute. I um, Internally at the association, I have a value that we lean in heavily called celebrate then um, iterate. And so at this message, I wanted to just talk about, let's celebrate that we have a community that wants to include everyone. And we have a very diverse group. And um, we know that together with different per um, perspectives that we are making uh, better software, but more than that, we're making a better shared human experience. And so I think we should really celebrate what we, um, who we are and what we value. And, um, and so once we celebrate that, then let's also iterate. We can do better, right? So at DrupalCon, we have a speaker diversity initiative where we want really high quality speakers and we want to have um, our speaker lineup just represent how, uh, like all the diversity in our community and have different voices. Um, and so uh, we've been, uh, last year was our first year doing it. 33% um, of our speakers came from underrepresented groups. And it was a really concerted effort to reach out to different kinds of um, communities, um, different people that may not normally speak that are, have a lot of great <laughs> wisdom to share. And we provided scholarships to help kind of bridge the gap to get them there. Uh, it was really successful, it was a good benchmark year. And uh, now for DrupalCon Nashville, we've done it again. And now 40% of our speakers come from <laughs> underrepresented groups. Um, and it's really great to have this kind of data and this passion and interest and willingness to get more voices out there because we're just better when we have different perspectives. perspectives. Um, and I think about it with, um, so I was advising the Docker community um, leadership and they were trying to work on diversity as well. You know, everyone's very passionate about this. Um, and um, you know, I realized that I was in a, the big topic was how can we make our community more diverse? And I was asked to come into a room of uh, mostly camp organizers around the world, and it happened to be a man, a, a room full of men, um, and that's and that's fine. But it's also a little like, oh, we have some work to do here, and we just talked about it's it's not hard to create diversity. All you have to do is ask. You have to look for some other leaders and ask them to join you. And, and, and you can share these roles, right? If you're a camp organizer, you can say, I'm gonna lead this camp and I would like you to lead it with me, right? And reach out to people from underrepresented groups to join you and to learn and mentor them. Um, and just help them find out what their blockers are and, and just bridge those gaps. Um, and this is not, um, you know, so what I'm saying is it's not unique to, uh, Drupal to have to work on this. We're all working on this. Docker's working on this and other technology groups. I do think we're further ahead and I'm really proud of that. And, uh, but we still have more to do, including myself. You know, somebody had said to me, Megan, look around. What voices don't you have at the table at the Drupal Association or on the board, right? And so even we have to think about this. And someone else said to me, Megan, have you sent the elevator back down? Right, I'm now the executive director of the Drupal Association. Have I sent the elevator down to find someone else and help them come up? Right? So those are things on my mind. We, we all have a role to play in creating an inclusive community. Um, but this is a strength of ours. So let me just talk quickly about some opportunities. So there are some CMS trends this year. Um, I've touched on this briefly. There's artificial intelligence. Everyone's talking about this, like, right? The rise of the robots, is, that's a thing. Personalization, like I said, I've been talking about this since 1999, right? But it's Headless, the omni-channel, right? You know, talk to that CMO, they're like, headless, what's that? Let's talk omni-channel. <laughs> so um, voice, right, everything with Alexa. Like these top four trends, they're content first. And Drupal, and they're complex. 
And this is where Drupal really shines. So I think there's some huge opportunities to position Drupal in these bigger conversations of emerging technologies and where companies want to go. Um, so SWAT, um, you know, I just did a really simple one. And I think the TLDR, I'm just kind of being mindful of time, is we have a lot of strengths, a lot of strengths. And there are many opportunities that are um, opening up to us, especially as like the marketing budgets are opening you know, for technology and we know that they need partnerships. They don't know how to do all of this. We're positioned really well to help them. Um, and um, you know, there are some weaknesses, but you know, we know what they are. We've already been working on them and uh, our community is really good about focusing and solving hard problems together. Uh, and then uh, threats, you know, there's many CMSs and guess what, that's life. It's called comp competition. You know, we know how to do that. We know how to solve for that too. So I think it's all really great. And um, okay, now you have to give me a time limit. You give a five minute warning. I mean, we have a big buffer today. Oh so yes, I, yeah. you guys okay if I just keep going? <laughs> so what we were thinking. Want to make sure I'm not sucking all the air out of the room. No, no, no. Not at all. <laughs> so we can always can the buff idea and still have time to head back early later at the end of the day. Okay. Snow, so don't worry. This is great. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, <coughs> So Drupal 8 is out, we've built something amazing, now we need to share it with the world. And so the number one goal of the project and therefore the association is to accelerate adoption. Specifically, we can do that in our channels on Drupal.org and DrupalCon. Um, and so that's been really top of mind. Um, and as I've been thinking about this, I've been thinking about the Drupal Association's DNA and we've been solving, uh, we've been serving the developer community very much. Uh, especially the contributors, you know, building them uh, the tools that they need to collaborate online um, and creating, uh, even DrupalCon is very much for the builder. Um, and I had, uh, and I had a change in perception that we need to expand, um, not leaving the developers behind, but just expanding how we serve our community and who our community is. And, uh, and you know, this is just one of those like personal stories that I want to share just so you can just understand where my where my head's at. And so I'll start the story by saying it has a happy ending. I'm totally fine. <laughs> but um, I had a digital experience that kind of changed my life. You know, it's Uber can change your life or Lyft, right? Like, oh, I got that car and it was cheaper. That's great. And it's like, I never really stop and think about that. I'm like, that was just a good experience. Um, but this was, a, it was, it was health related. I had a health scare, as we all do as we get older, you know, that happens. And so I had to go uh, and get a lot of tests really fast to see what's going on. I'm going to this hospital, and it's a little scary, right? Like when you're going through this, you have these emotional experiences like, okay, I know what I have to do, and I've got a good doctor, and, um, you know, but you're, you're nervous. You're not quite thinking well. And so you, I went through this hospital experience that was really, they clearly had like um, usability testing in the entire process. And it was very digital throughout the whole thing. So wherever I was, I had my phone and I had my patient portal. And I'm getting in line and they had things happening with kiosks that were telling me information that was personalized to me as I was putting in my information or they were swiping my little, my little wristband. And um, I'm going from doctor to doctor and this scan and that test. And, and I'm, I'm like, I don't even know who I'm seeing and what's coming next. I just know that like I'm getting updates on my phone of who I need to go see. I'm getting reports sent to me on my phone. Um, just like, it was just amazing how I felt so much more in control at a time that was chaos, right? Like you're just scared and you're just like, I don't know what's happening, but it's like, it's amazing this experience that I had, the information really helped me. Now in the end, guess what? I'm totally fine. I'm just, you know, I'm in my 40s, and this, this is just what happens. So I just want you to know that everything's fine, but this experience really had a profound effect on me because I had to think, I stopped and I thought about how did they build that, right? Like the Drupal Association, we talk about the de developers, someone built that, but I'm like, no, there was so much more that went into this. There were, um, uh, you know, the user, user, uh, the user experience was amazing. The content was amazing. It was highly personalized to where I was, sometimes even in the hospital because of beacons and things like that, right? It was just really um, so much more than just a developer building with a team. 
And I realized that if we want to create amazing digital experiences and have more of that, the association needs to change its thinking and not just serve these builders, but the whole chain of personas that decide on the technology, and build, and put in all the content and create this user experience. And so I, I've really started to make a shift in having these conversations at the board level where we are now talking about, okay, like we need to serve all these personas. We need to make them all power users in the way that they're using Drupal so that together they can make these amazing digital experiences that have an impact with people like me. So that is one big change. So to accelerate Drupal, I've realized we need to kind of expand um, who we're serving. And um, so, you know, I kind of break it down until I think about, well, what's the, what's the work that we need? Um, and who are these personas along the way? So of course, on the adoption side, you have your decision makers, you have your influencers, and then they become users. And then you've got your, your teams that are building, you've got your marketing teams, you've got trainers in there, right? Um, and then, of course, you have the community. Um, and, and that needs to be not just <laughs> our developers, right? We need more marketers in our community, too. Um, you know, if you're having a camp and you're a bunch of developers that are creating a camp, you're going to have amazing content. But I bet you would love to have some content editors and marketing people that can help you get the word out, right? Like, there's just a lot of roles for all these personas, and we need them all. So I, I've been thinking a lot about how to bridge that gap and create an on-ramp for some of these new personas to join our community. Um, now, I have to, so I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing to accelerate adoption in our channels. And I have to just point out that we are 17 people with an event and a website. And that is not to diminish the hard work and the important work the staff is doing. I'd just like to be very clear that we have to be very specific about and very mindful of the work that we choose to do. So we really went for the um, high impact near term um, uh, efforts. Uh, and so I'll just kind of give you a quick update. So one, we are starting a, uh, an effort to understand the um, Drupal life cycle, the customer life cycle, the journey of someone evaluating and becoming a user. And we want to understand the decision maker, decision maker personas throughout that. And one of uh, Annie Miller from WPP, our board member, is helping to lead that charge. And we're going to use that to start evolving all of our programs so that DrupalCon is not just an event for builders, but for everyone and get them all under the same roof. So my whole thing is, it's like there are a chain of personas, and no chain is stronger than its weakest link. So how can we use our events or our website to really strengthen everyone as they use Drupal? Um, and then in our channels, we want to really inspire and inform those um, evaluators that are coming in. We have amazing stories to tell that we're not doing as well as we could. So I want to get more case studies out there, whether it's at DrupalCon or whether it's at, on Drupal.org, and make them really front and center, because we have amazing stories. And then we want to accelerate that evaluation path. So for example, if you come to Drupal.org today, and maybe you saw the blog post from, I forget his last name, but Matthew did a study of what's the evaluation path like for Drupal versus Laravel versus WordPress. You know, there's a lot of um, blockers in our evaluation path on Drupal.org. We want to really accelerate that, so we're doing some user research on Drupal.org and, and, and looking to see how we can improve that and giving people the resources they need to say, yes, I want to keep going in this path. And ultimately, what we want is to connect them with the digital agencies a lot better than we are doing today. Um, and then we also are going to work on some product improvements. So the community, uh, as you know, they're the ones that um, do these different initiatives to evolve the product, but the association actually has a role in the product, too. Um, whether it's our tools and things like that. But um, we've left a lot of people behind because they don't use Composer. And so we want to bring them back. We want them using Drupal 8. Um, and that can really bump up the numbers in terms of people that are building and, and acquiring clients with Drupal. So we're going to build a tool for those site builders so that they kind of we can bridge the gap for them. Um, and then also, we just want to reduce some barriers um, of entry. So that total cost of ownership area, that's something that we can help with by starting the auto updates initiative. Um, and, and that's going to be, I think, pretty helpful with that mid-market. So that's a few things that we're doing. On the user side, this is all about the retention. We're going to have to do a lot of work here. I only have two bullets. But one is understand our users. We don't know who all of our customers are. We say we have a million sites pinging Drupal.org getting updates, and we don't know who they are. So we're working with Drupal Core to start to get that data. And that data is going to tell us a lot. And um, I'm pretty excited, to, you know, what we can do with that data. 
Um, and then again, I talked about how we're going to expand the types of our users that we serve. So we need to start understanding that. And you know, this year will just be a year of learning. On the community side, um, I want to create those on ramps for um, personas that are not part of our community today that should be. So for example, um, customers, so those of you that are um, using Drupal for your organization, we, you are part of our community. We want to find a place where you have a lot that you can provide in terms of feedback on the product or just unique skills. Um, so at DrupalCon, I'm going to have a round table that's hosted by Mike Lamb of Pfizer, which is going to be a peer-to-peer -peer discussion of how do we as um, leaders in different organizations create our own community within this greater community, and where can we start to um, maybe invest back into the community for, a, a, for the purpose of having a bigger impact on our business with Drupal. So I want to start having these roundtables just to create these good um, on-ramps for these personas that we, we don't have in our community today that we need. Um, and we also uh, do a lot with our community in terms of recognizing. It's kind of people want to give, but sometimes they want, you know, they want some recognition for that work that they've done, some of its social capital that they get. And right now we've been putting a lot of emphasis on um, those that contribute code, and that's important, but things like camps that are real marketing machines happening all over the world, those camp organizers deserve recognition. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, the five minutes. So, anyhow, so we're going to start doing that, and um, we're going to keep looking at improving our developer tools. Um, and so we're also doing all of our user research, looking at different best practices that other technology companies are um, uh, do, using for their evaluation path. And so you're going to start seeing Drupal.org evolve. This is just a comp, but you're going to see that we're going to do some um, different paths for different kinds of evaluators, making it an easier, smoother experience. And um, there are other things that are on my mind that I want to have as a conversation. So we're going to accelerate. We need to define what growth is. It can't be total percent of market share of, of the whole web of the world of the internet, right? We need to get clear about what success is so we feel like we have something to celebrate. Um, we also need to talk about how we fund the growth of this project, right? So like, where's my money for radio ads? Not that I want to buy radio ads. <laughs> um, and then how do we better support Drupal agencies? You are, as I mentioned, our double levers for growth. Um, we need to be doing more. I, I, I see the association could be more of a trade association um, to support you all in a much bigger way. And I want to have that conversation. Um, and then this is just one last story about why ad adoption matters, right? You can't just grow for growth's sake. There's a reason why we need to grow. And this is my personal why, and I'll just use my two minutes to tell my story. This is my sister. She's a climate scientist. Um, as you know, in the U.S., climate scientists are being defunded. You're not allowed to use the word climate science. So there's a reason it's a fuzzy picture. Yeah, it's, it's a real problem. Um, anyhow, she uh, called me up. Uh, a year or two ago, and she's like, hey, guess what? Uh, she works for the United States Geological Survey. It's a, org a federal organization. Uh, they do applied science um, to help re you know, improve climate, basically. And uh, she said, hey, guess what? We're using Drupal. By the way, I can't get my picture up on my bio page. Can you help me? <laughs> I was like, all right, we have to fix that. But uh, she and I started to realize, like, you know, my sister and I are very different people. We don't have a lot in common other than we love each other because we're sisters. And, um, but I realized we have something very special in common. And when you look at her story, she went to Cornell University and helped them, like, come, to, come up with an environmental um, undergraduate degree because they didn't really have one that was, you know, she was kind of early. So she, she went there. Then she got a full ride at, at San Francisco State University to kind of continue her education in environmental sciences. She got her PhD at University of Berkeley of California. Um, with a specialty in remote imagery and using that for environmental studies. And then ultimately she got this job at the federal government uh, at the U.S. Geological Survey doing applied science. So that means that she's going to go out and help farmers understand the impact that they have on the water systems in, in their area and then come up with scenarios and um, options for them to reduce the pesti pesticide that's flowing into the water, right? So like directly applied to saving the environment. Anyhow, when you work for this organization, you have a job, but you don't have money. You have to go find your own money for your research. <laughs> and so um, because of her specialty with remote imagery, that satellite stuff, she gets millions of dollars from NASA. And then she works with them. So she um, basically 
coordinates to get satellites to fly over her research areas, like the San Francisco Bay, and then she goes out in a boat, and then she collects water samples, and she ends up doing this a couple times in a longitudinal, longitudinal study, uh, correlating the data to see how, if her work is improving the water that she's um, trying to address. And um, every organization I just mentioned is on Drupal, and she is working um, with scientists at all of these institutions passing information back and forth using Drupal. And she's getting her grants and submitting applications for grants through Drupal, right? <laughs> and so it's like, I've realized it's like, I need to make sure Drupal is thriving because my sister's depending on it, right? And if I can help my sister save the planet, think of all the other people we're helping out in the world. And so that's my why of why we need to grow adoption. So thank you.